Thanks so much for joining us here on KFFB's Open Mic. And we do have a special guest today, and I'm really excited about two-time Grammy Award winner Lawrence Jubers with me right now. And Lawrence, thanks so much for taking time and talking with us. It's a great honor. Oh, you're very welcome. Happy to be here. Well, you know, one thing that we were talking about when you were coming, that you were the one of the first guitarist for Paul McCartney and Wings, and, and you won a Grammy Award with the work that you did with Paul. And and it's a different mm -hmm. aspect interviewing somebody that's been with Elvis or the Beatles and Paul McCartney. It puts you in a total different realm of musicians. And what was it like? I mean, that's what everybody asks, but it is something that draws people into the interview thinking that, wow, you kind of blazed a path that many people follow now musically. <laughs> well, I, I studied music at London University and went from being a, a music student into being a studio musician straight away. And then out of being a studio musician, I was asked to join Wings with Paul. So I, I like to refer to my period working with Paul as getting my master's degree from McCartney University because it was an amazing education. I, and in terms of a kind of a musical historical perspective, it really, you know, because I'd studied music and its history, what it allows me to do is look back on that and, and see in terms of Paul McCartney as an artist and as a former Beatle and the role that I played working with him and, and to recognize the fact that the, the Beatles music is canonical. It's, it's part of the canon of popular music in the same way as Beethoven or Schubert or Mozart were in their own era. That they are, the music of the Beatles is our classical music in a sense. So it has, it has a lot of depth and a lot of dimension that, that not only in terms of the fan aspect of things, but also just in terms of, of the musical substance of it and how much there is to be gained from that as a musician by playing, in my case, by arranging, you know, I've arranged now, I'm just about to release my fourth album of Beatle music for solo acoustic guitar. It's a continuing education for me, but it's also a source of great entertainment for audiences because they love that music and they relate to it. And I don't think it's ever going to go away. I mean, the Beatles kind of like Shakespeare in that respect. But they'll be, you know, they'll, people will still be listening to Beatle music, you know, whatever, whatever format exists 200 years from now, whether it's, you know, wave files being directly transplanted into people's brains. We're almost there now anyway. But, you know, I grew up in an age where you went out and, you know, I collected my pennies and went and bought the latest Beatles single, you know, on a seven-inch vinyl. So even though the medium of, of communicating music has changed so much, you know, the things that haven't, the music itself hasn't changed, and radio hasn't really changed, other than a little technological difference. But, you know, it's always great for me to be on the radio because I grew up listening to the radio, the BBC and Radio Luxembourg in England, was where I heard all the my my early experience of pop music and Beatles included. Well, that's why we always say it's timeless, and it is music that is timeless. That's what we always say with our moniker. You know, when you look at that though, and I know this is kind of funny putting you back many many years when you got the phone call, letter, or in person. What was your first reaction when you were invited to join Paul? Well, the phone call I, was funny because I was at Abbey Road. I was working in Studio Two, which was the Beatle main studio just by coincidence and that was when I got a phone call and I had to go up into the control room which I never did and the musicians always stayed down in the studio and there's a long staircase that goes up to the control room and I, there was a phone call for me which was very unusual and it turned out that it was McCartney's office wanting to know if I was available to come and jam with Denny Lane on Monday and oh by the way Paul and Linda will be there. So uh, happily I was available and the, the first thing I did was contacted my brother and asked to borrow some of his Wings LPs because I didn't really have any Wings, of uh, any of the material, and I needed to do a little homework. Realized that it was going to be tough to be really well prepared, and so I kind of walked in, if you excuse the, the pun, I winged it when we did the audition. And, and at the moment where Paul said, what are you doing for the next few years? That was that nanosecond of having to really process the idea that the career that I'd spent all of my teenage years building up to as a studio musician was going to have to be put to the side in order to become Paul McCartney's lead guitar player. And so for a nanosecond, I gave it deep thought. And then I said, I guess I'm playing with you, Governor. 
it was a little tough for me because I had to give up all that work that I'd established. But I wasn't going to turn down the opportunity to work with the Beatles. And then when you look at it, what was your favorite song to play with, Paul? Live, I think Let It Be, for a couple of reasons. One, because it, he didn't do very many Beatles songs when we performed live. It was a handful that we did. And that's such a, a, a wonderful song. And I got to really kind of create my own lead guitar solo for it. You know, because in the way that the Beatles Let It Be album was done, there were a few different George had done a few different uh, solos on it, and there wasn't necessarily one that was definitive that I that I was kind of obligated to play. So I had a certain amount of freedom with it, you know, which was a little unusual because there, there's not a lot of long guitar solos in Wings music. I mean, you, you kind of picked your spots, and, and just being on stage with Paul McCartney playing an iconic Beatles song was was pretty amazing. So there's a there's a very cool live version of that from the uh, the last Glasgow concert that we did in uh, 1979, which was the same show that uh, Live Coming Up uh, single came from. So um, there was that. But um, my other favorite one is is a, a song called Spin It On that's on the Back to the Egg album that is a really it's like punk rockabilly and it's so not Beatlish in and yet it is. And I got a lot of freedom uh, to create the guitar solos on that. So those are two that I would, I, I would pick. But, but Let It Be, certainly from the live perspective, was a, a very special one for me. And tell us about the latest release called The Fab Fourth. Well, I did an album 20 years ago. I did an album called LJ Plays the Beatles. And LJ, that's me. I, 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 when I came to America and, and a few people started referring to somebody named Larry, I had no idea who Larry was until I discovered it was me. And, you know, I was never called Larry in England. And, and my friends were calling me LJ, and LJ kind of became my brand, as it were. I did an album called LJ in the mid-90s. And so I did this record, LJ Plays the Beatles, where I chose a, a, a bunch of Beatles songs and did solo guitar arrangements of them. And my wife, Hope, was really the instigator of it because she loved to hear me play Beatles songs and because she listens to me practicing hours and hours a day. She said, well, play more Beatles. And so, I, you know, eventually I said, well, look, you produce the record and I'll, I'll do all these arrangements. And, and it went over very well. And I subsequently did LJ Plays the Beatles Volume 2. And then a few years ago, LJ Can't Stop Playing the Beatles. And Hope said, you know, you've got to do one more because and, and, I've got a title. And the title was The Fab Four. And, and so I agreed to do that. And that, um, that comes out March 27th. I'll have advanced copies of the CD at the, um, at the concert. And what is a song that one of your favorites off this project? <laughs> oh, that's always a tricky one. I know Hope's favorite is Across the Universe, which is the, the opening cut. I'm also, I quite like Back in the USSR. And, you know, I tend to like the, the more guitaristically challenging ones like um, Lady Madonna and stuff like that. But I think Across the Universe is kind of the, it, it, it sets a, a distinct mood for the record. You know, when you're playing, uh, I mean, you play such a wide range of music. So you really just love all music, it looks like, when you look at your bio, but from folk to blues, jazz, rock, what would your most favorite that you always seem like you go back to? <laughs> um, that's a tricky question because, it, you know, give me, if you said, what do you want to do tonight, guitar-wise? I'll say, okay, I want to play some blues on electric guitar. You know, that's kind of a my recreational aspect of, of guitar playing. Um, to be honest, you know, I'm, I mean, there are there are aspects to my career. One is that I always wanted to be a professional guitar player. And I consider myself a musician who plays guitar. That Because I've also, I've composed for video games and movies and television. I've written for orchestras. I've arranged, I've produced, I've produced, produced four albums for Al Stewart, who's great English folk rock songwriter. And I'm just as much at home, you know, playing in a, in a, a, a classical style ensemble as I am in a in a rock band or or a jazz band or whatever. I, I love music and I love being able to apply my guitaristic abilities and my musical knowledge to the different styles. And of course, that is always 
an essential aspect of being a studio musician is to be versatile. And so I always, that was the thing that I was kind of aimed for was to be a versatile musician and, and guitar player. When I'm playing solo acoustic guitar, when I'm doing my concerts, there's also the other hat that I'm wearing is, is that of an entertainer, is to keep the audience entertained, tell a few stories in between tunes and, and vary the show so that you know, because there's little or no vocals in what I do, I want to be able to keep people engaged, keep the audience engaged with the musical substance of it, with familiar tunes, whether it's Beatle tunes or songs from the Great American Songbook or some other pop standards, and mixed in with some original material. It just it gives an audience a, a journey, as it were, to, um, to kind of appreciate the range that an acoustic guitar can, uh, can deliver. When you look at uh, the fingerstyle guitar, you know, that's something that you regard as a master of. Is there any fingerstyle guitar players that you see and look up to and you think that this is really a mastery? I mean, when you say, boy, they do a good job too. If you're referring to like living guitar players, there are, there are players you know, that I am, have shared stages with, played duets with. I mean, I just last week was doing some jazz concerts with Martin Taylor, who's a great Scottish uh, fingerstyle jazz player. I've shared the stage with Tommy Emmanuel, who's who's a master guitar player. I could give you a long list of of studio players in Los Angeles who are just really great players. But you know, these are players that you've heard, like myself in my own studio work. You hear what we do, but you don't necessarily know who it is that's doing it. But historically, I mean, my primary influences as a fingerstyle player. Were, were the players out of um, what we refer to in England as the folk Baroque, or in England, the folk Baroque. We re pronounce it Baroque rather than Baroque, uh, um, which would be John Remborn and Bert Jansch from Pentangle, for example. But I was also influenced by, by ragtime players uh, like Stefan Grossman. When I was a teenager, I mean, it was the contemporary players that were influencing me. As I got older and I started to dig deeper into the history of, of guitar playing, I, you know, then found players that, I mean, for example, you know, Django Reinhardt, who wasn't a fingerstyle player, he was a flat picking uh, gypsy jazz player, but his peer in, in Paris was Oscar Alleman, an Argentine guitar player, who was really a remarkable player, who was also um, Josephine Baker's musical director, really just remarkable guitar playing. And of course, on the classical side, there were English guitar players like Ju Julian Bream and John Williams, who were kind of the next generation on from Segovia. And I studied classical guitar as a teenager. So that's where some of my right hand, my, my fingerstyle technique comes from. But again, it's, you know, I, I'm so eclectic in my musical tastes that it's, it, it's a very broad range. And of course, there's, you know, the blues players, you know, like Robert Johnson and and it just, it's a long list. I mean, we could be here all day discussing influential guitar players. When you're a professional player like you are, and you like listening to the radio, and that's something we talked at the beginning of the interview, do you find yourself saying, oh, they could have done a little better with that when you're listening to music? Is, is it hard sometimes for you to listen to some of the today's music? Um, I don't listen to a lot of contemporary music. I do listen to the stuff that my daughter Ilse writes because she's a songwriter that's had some hits. She co-wrote Panic at the Disco's High Hopes, for example. Um, she works with Miley Cyrus and Mark Ronson. Uh, in fact, she has a song on Harry Styles' latest album that I played on, a song called Treat People with Kindness. So I listen to some of that stuff, but I, I just don't have the time to be really alert to to what's going on in the full range of contemporary music. In fact, that makes it difficult. I'm in the uh, recording academy, and it makes it difficult to vote at Grammy time because there's just so much music to try and catch up on, and there's just not enough hours in the day. So, um, I mean, there's certainly plenty of good stuff out there. I'm just, but, but I do, I, ha I tend to have a critical ear when I'm listening. I bet, I can't, it's kind of, I can't really help it. You know? Right. I bet that's tough for your daughter too. You know, that's uh, with the master and when she was growing up, you know, and, and to be able to be in the business. She forged her own path with it. 
so uh, I've not been a critic of her writing. It's more, you know, that's what she does. I do what I do. I try not to be critical in a creative situation because you don't want to inhibit creativity. Because, I mean, sometimes it might take three or four listens to something to really understand what the artist is going for. And there's always something new to hear. I mean, I cannot listen to a Beatle record ever without hearing something that I never heard before. I just played this last Sunday um, in L.A. at the Grammy Museum. We did a recreation of the, the Rubber Soul album, and I played lead guitar in that. And, and just the, the depth and dimension of that music and how the, the layers of, of the, the different aspects, the, the melody, you know, the backing vocals, the, the guitar parts, how everything meshes together. And uh, when you really start getting in and learning individual part and you see how the whole jigsaw puzzle fits together, it's really, a, it's remarkable. Now, you're going to be coming to town to ASU and BB, and that's going to be tomorrow, actually. And what's amazing is you're going to be doing a free seminar or workshop, which to be able to watch a master and come hear you do a seminar, what can a person expect? They've been describing it as me talking about the history of fingerstyle guitar, but it's actually going to be more than that. The, the breadth of what I do is I call it guitar mania to Beatle mania. And basically it's a history of guitar and going back to, I mean, going back thousands of years and how it's been used musically. And the fact that the, the guitar and its cousins like the lute and in Spain, an instrument called the fujuela, which was a cross between the lute and what we would look at as a guitar how that music was predominantly fingerstyle. And I'll play some examples of uh, some of the earliest published music for, for fretted instruments. And also discuss how the chord progressions that evolved in, in those early years in the 16th century are still really forming the basis of, of contemporary music. And I go through the history of it when the guitar became a six-string instrument in the eight, late 18th century, and then the guitar mania overtakes Europe, and then how the guitar moved to America, and then even beyond America. How all of these kind of what I call touchstones in the history of it influenced the Beatles. I mean, there's, you can draw a direct line from the Beatles to, to Johann Sebastian, or from Bach to the Beatles, historically in that direction, via Chet Atkins. And how, where did Chet Atkins come from? Or Mel Travis and the, 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 the Southern, what, what we call finger style in Kentucky is, you know, what they call thumb picking there. How that evolved and how it influenced the Beatles. And I'll take examples of Beatles songs and examples of other popular songs and show where the roots are and how the guitar has been the common denominator through all of that. It's really quite an interesting uh, session. I, I have a slideshow that goes along with it. I talk, I play some examples, and people can ask questions. And it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a seminar, really. I know it's going to be a great seminar tomorrow and, and the concert that people are going to be going to. But talking about some of the finger-style guitars, who, who is a hero we can end the program with? I, I would say, you know, play something by Mel Travis. I mean, he's a great American finger-style player. And uh, only a, a minor influence on me as a teenager. I had one Mel Travis album. But he's really one of the icons in that world. I mean, when you think about it, there's Chet Atkins and there's Mel Travis, and those are really the guys that came out of that. Kentucky style of playing and you know anybody that comes to my my seminar tomorrow will get some insight into where that style of guitar playing evolved and how different it is from the core of what I do which really has more it's much more English in my approach.